therapy, a lecture I gave uh, last year, first time. I'll give it again today in brief. Uh, another one on uh, secretagogue technology. Um, let's see what else is there. Um, update on growth hormone, uh, the cancer link. It's a very clear link, but you have to really abuse the system to get it. And then the uh, fourth lecture is on, I don't know what, but it's there. I'm uh, running on about two hours of uh, sleep in the past two days, so uh, if I seem a little hyper at times, uh, it's the adrenaline kicking in, or the coffee. Okay, uh, you can fill it out at any time and drop it off. Also, in the book, there are um, one, two, three, four chapters that deal with some of the legal documents in the office. We spent over $200,000 with lawyers, malpractice, and whatever with some of the forms. Also, uh, all the forms that r we run the office on, which are updated every year, we try to find newer ways to uh, present, represent the same information uh, to acquire from the patients. Um, there's a handbook, which is a PR tool that I don't do any advertising. What happens is the handbook for males and females uh, is uh, impressive uh, because most doctors don't give any information to their patients when they do laboratory work other than to say, you're fine. Well, this is a format and protocol uh, which will allow you to present the information to your patients in a nice booklet. The female's booklet is maybe 40 pages. The male's uh, is about 50 pages, and there are a couple of new uh, papers that go into it, and they're written in English, not medical ease, and um, they're updated every year also. Um, what happens frequently is that a patient will show friends, relatives the book, and that becomes a marketing tool as well as a very comprehensive uh, review of the patient's um, lab results. Also, it includes a suggested uh, protocol with morning, afternoon, and evening. You'll see it uh, up here morning, afternoon, and evening uh, dosing of whatever it is and um, that they're given, and then the rationale, explanation of all the labs, why we do them step by step in English, so that people know, you know why you do a C-reactive protein. And then there's some research articles or articles that have come out either in lay press or in you know, uh, CRP Health with Dr. Paul Riker, who's probably the number one person in CRP-related <coughs> issues and you can go online and get them, uh, crphealth.com. So um, let's see, we have uh, DVDs for uh, the entire composition of our office legal documents, uh, also the male and female handbook, um, office protocol for the front desk, uh, and then there's a uh, uh, file that has some of the television stuff that you can show people relative to um, uh, benefits uh, that have been on television. And time to start. Go. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, putting aside this time. Hopefully, it'll be of some use to you. Uh, in the 14 years that I've practiced this area of anti aging medicine, which has evolved into Interventional endocrinology, which in the book explains how it came to be in a nutshell. You know, I had moved away from the crowd that I was in for 18 years practicing illness medicine and ran into one doc in the parking garage of the building that I'm presently in when there's no fires. And um, he said, uh, long time no see, what are you doing? I said, I'm doing anti-aging medicine. Immediately he starts talking about my dog, my three daughters, my wife, blah, blah, blah. And that was it. And a couple months later, an uh, orthopedist uh, moved in above me, and uh, we ran into each other. He says, uh, what are you doing? I said, uh, after stopping, so I remember the last occasion, I said, uh, interventional endocrinology. He looked at me and said, what's that? And we had a 30-minute conversation, which opened his eyes, and unfortunately, he never used it, but at least opened his eyes. OK. What we're going to do is follow the book uh, as closely as can be. Dr. John Chrysler will uh, be talking on testosterone therapy, and we'll get there. Noisy. 
Anyway, as a disclaimer, uh, this book is about my experience. It's not telling you what to do. It's just giving you my experience over the past, uh, now it's 14 years. At this point, I think it was 10 years, and, um, or 12 years, as it says here, with over 6,000 patient cycles. And I come from a research background, so it means that I play around, and I keep documents on what I do. And what I basically do is I'll try protocol A, B, and C with one option different and see which works the best. And those are the nuances that I'll be sharing with you uh, throughout today. Okay. Um, again, because of the legal aspects to uh, the use of growth hormone and so forth, I'm not telling you to use things that shouldn't be used. And we'll go into some of the legal stuff in the book. Is a chapter on legal aspects. That was written by Dr. Uh, Dr. by Rick Collins, who's touted for being uh, knowledgeable in this area of uh, hormones. So he donated that chapter to us. And as you know, semantically, anti-aging medicine doesn't exist as a discipline in medicine, and therefore never put it into your chart, never refer to it. If you pub if you advertise or promote your practice under anti-aging medicine. Just be aware, I think it's in Kansas, it's illegal to promote it. In California, it's coming close to that. So find another semantic way of uh, presenting that you're doing anti-aging. But anti-aging is a gestalt concept that the populace understand, the common, understand what it's supposed to mean. So we're stuck in how best to promote ourselves and what we do. Let's move that over there. Oh, duh. Okay. One of the keys to how I practice is based upon Dr. Carl Sagan's statement, and this is the only slide that I'll actually read because it's extremely important that you understand what the other side is not even considering and what we consider. And that scientist must hover in a strangely divided state of mind, open to all things yet close to anything but the most rigorously proven hypotheses. Science requires a strange mating of two contradictory tendencies, a willingness to consider even the most bizarre ideas, and at the same time, a harsh skepticism requiring hard evidence to back up every claim. What I've been doing for the past 14 years is accumulating the positives, accumulating the negatives, and the one that weighs the heaviest wins. So the objectives, we're going to go through the book and pull out a lot of information that will hopefully help to ramp you up, to fine-tune things. If there are any questions, get in touch with me by email. I'm going to be around until Saturday. Talk to me throughout the time that I'm here. And as I said earlier, there's a lot of legal intake forms. We send out 13 pages. That's a medical legal issue, which deals with if you write into, the, into your chart, patient feels weak uh, in your handwriting write down all the symptomatology that we do. If you should be audited, they'll say, okay, but what is the patient really saying? Because uh, what's happened is doctors have uh, falsified or inappropriately entered um, symptomatic complaints which are not in the pen of the patient. And in the state of California, Kansas, New York, and so forth, they uh, will attack you. So a lot of documents that the patient fills out will help to protect you. The young man over here, newly wed. <clears throat> Took me weeks to try and convince him not to. Uh, what will happen is uh, Dr. Chrysler is uh, well known in the area of testosterone, all things male. He's been doing it for years and years. And by the finish of this, my throat's usually dry, so I needed someone to abuse to uh, give a great presentation, as he always does. We met uh, three or four years ago uh, lecturing in a team and uh, always impressed by uh, the delivery of the information that he has. Uh, schedule's a little off. Anyway, chapter one. Question is to intervene or not. In anti-aging medicine or interventional endocrinology, the contrast between those of us who do interventional or preventive medicine compared to the docs who do illness medicine, uh, they wait until you're sick and dying before you intervene. Those of us who are in proactive medicine, uh, we don't wait until the sickness occurs. We monitor labs and we'll intervene. And the argument is always, at what point? Is it the numbers, or are they the numbers, or is it the combination of the patient and the numbers? 